And so today is going to be an opening lesson on becoming a mystical mother for a priest in the divine will. It's a mission promulgated from Mother Asunta, Sister Asunta, there in the Public Association of the Faithful. May she rest in peace. And I'll, I'll just turn it over to you, Father. Thank you. Okay. Did you notice the first reading at Mass from the Acts of the Apostles? It's the first mention of a car in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. It says the Apostles, Mary and the disciples, were all in one accord. We need to be in one accord, right? We do God's work, we need to be in one accord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on his servant in your holiness. Henceforth, all ages will call me master. The Almighty has done great things for me. Holy is he. His mercy is from age to age, and those who fear He puts forth his arm and strength and scatters the bad heart. He casts the mighty from their thrones and raises the lowly. He fills the sky with good things and sends the rich away empty. He protects Israel, his servant, remembering his mercy. The mercy promised to our fathers, to Abraham and his sons forever. Glory to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, forever and ever our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity, pray for us. Our Lady Mother of all priests, pray for us. Our Lady Mother of the Church, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Angels and saints of God, pray for us. Better get Saint Joseph in there for the men because <laughs> he was the father of a priest, the adoptive father of a priest, which is a higher order, than the natural son. I was at Knock recently, and you see that 2,000 years ago, when John wrote the book of the Apocalypse, the word apocalypse in Greek means to unveil, like to pull back the veil so that you can see clearly. And uh, so 2,000 years later at Knock in 1879, the veil was pulled back in that little village for the people on a rainy night, rain pouring down, a veil was pulled back and they could see heaven. And then you see what happens when the veil was pulled back. So here we are all going there and we're seeing what John saw 2000 years ago. And then we're able to order our lives to the things of heaven. And when we do that, everything on earth falls into place. You get the order backwards, you're struggling all the time and trying to fix things and looking for healing and looking for peace and everything, you know. It have to be ordered to the things of the heaven first. And so that's why when I was thinking of the priesthood, we're very familiar after two years ago with the sacrificial redemptive priesthood of Christ. That he came on this earth, he suffered on the cross, he gave himself his body and blood, at the Last Supper, he instituted the sacraments to redeem us from our sins. But then I felt God saying to me, no, take them back a step before that. Take them back into Our Lady, and then take them back into the Trinity, where the priesthood comes from. You see, Jesus says that to Louisa. He says to Louisa, I want you to write everything down. And Louisa says, write everything down for 30 years. And can I just write this bit? She said, Jesus, my blood freezes in my veins at having to reveal what goes back between you and I. It's such a martyrdom for her. Not the writing, but to reveal her, her inner soul and her discussions with Jesus, you know. And Jesus said, no, write everything down, he says, because he said, the world will read it. And once they have the knowledges, they will start to want it. And wanting it, they'll start to love it. 
And if they love it, they receive the possession of it. So that's how you receive the possession of the divine will. You've got to begin with the knowledges. And those little knowledges start to attract you, attract you to the things of heaven. And then you start to order yourself to the things of heaven first. And you fall in love with the things of heaven. And then God says, here, here's the gift of living in my divine will. Because you love it. You can possess it. And you'll be okay with it. And so that's why it was um, what we call mystical theology. Mystical simply means it's beyond our total grasp. But in a mystery, you enter right into it. You live in it. It's not like a problem or a puzzle to be solved, you know. So God was taking us into the mystery of his priesthood, right back to the Father. And then we start to say, oh, okay, <clears throat> listen to that talk again. <laughs> and uh, and then, then you start to love it and want to order yourself according to it. Okay. So we had everybody. I, I just noticed there in the... You know, I'm 25 years a priest, and I've said, I don't know, 6,000 masses. You'd think I'd be a better saint than I am after 6,000 masses, <laughs> but here I am. And um, <clears throat> just the beginning of the Third Eucharistic Prayer, I'm standing at the altar this morning because these knowledges are opening me more and more to... Uh, um, the order of heaven. You know, how many times have I prayed the Eucharistic prayer? But it begins, you are indeed holy, O Lord. Right? And I said this morning, that's what Christ says to the Father as he comes forth, as the eternal Son in the mystery of the Trinity. He says, you are holy, Father. He returns the holiness. God is holy, holy, holy. All the angels in heaven are going holy, holy, holy to the Trinity. So as Christ comes forth from the Father, he returns thanksgiving for the holiness of the Father, which he also possesses as God, but he returns thanksgiving. So you, you hear Christ saying this, and all you have created rightly gives you grace, grace, because that's the gift of the Son to the Father in the mystery of the chain. He praises the Father as he comes forth from the Father. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the oh, Holy Spirit, so Trinity, straight away in the Third Eucharistic Prayer. You give life to all things and make them holy. See? It's a priestly action, beginning in the Trinity and then flowing out to the Holy Spirit. And you never cease to gather a people. So there's the covenant, right? And how do you adopt a priest? Well, you have to be adopted into the communion of the saints and the Trinity, and then you can adopt in a special way individuals such as priests. So that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered in your name, and then we come to the redemptive priesthood. So we're now offering Christ on earth because we're still in sin, and, and we have to come to a holy complete holiness. Therefore, O oh Lord, we humbly implore you by the same Spirit, graciously make oh, holy, holy these yes. gifts. Because we're a priestly people, so we have to offer sacrifice and gift to the Father in, in our common priesthood. That they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries, mysteries because we are mystical mothers of Christ. <laughs> So you're in the mystery. Not something you can't know. You do know it. You'll never fully know it. But you'll always enjoy it for all eternity. Okay. That's just an example from Mass this morning. Again, because I was talking to you about it and asking God to teach me more about how the priesthood of Christ is from eternity in that direction. Not just, to the, not just for, for eternity, but from all eternity. I was so sensitive to the words this morning that it just went boom in a new way after 6,000 masses. Okay. So we ended up by saying that um, this beautiful description of the Council of Trent 
of how Mary was the mother of a priest. She didn't begin with Christ. She began at her own conception in the Trinity, as daughter of the Father, spouse of the Holy Spirit. Was she the mother of Christ before she conceived him? Yeah, she yes. was the daughter. Yeah, yeah, she was. Was she the daughter of the father at her own conception? Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, because she was she was conceived not just without original sin, but in the divine will. That was the inheritance of Mary. In the divine will, there's no suffering or anything. She was conceived in the divine will of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Is that one of us? Oh, yeah, okay, so starting we have a ring of the bell. Often the bell goes here because people are looking for food and other things during the day, so we don't. Okay, so she was daughter of the Father and she was espoused to the Holy Spirit from her conception. But you see, Jesus, you know the woman who says, Blessed are the breasts that suckled you and the womb that bore you. You know that woman? And she said, no, no, more blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Yeah, because that's where Mary's holiness begins, not just when she conceived Christ in the womb, but in welcoming the word of God. So I, I love that woman because I think there's three reasons she's looking at Christ saying, I wish... I was your mother. Yeah. <laughs> There's something about him. She just wants to be his mother. Blessed. Whoever your mother is, blessed are the breasts that suckled you in the womb that bore you. So number one, she's either barren and she's no children. And she looks at Christ and said, Now that's the type of son I wish I had <laughs> if I was her child. Or else she has a pile of kids and she knows the joy of giving birth and that every time she has a child her heart gets bigger because that's the way god designed your hearts to be embrace children the more children you have the bigger your heart gets or else she has a son who's in trouble he's in prison broke the law the romans have him in prison they're going to kill him and she looks at jesus and i wish my boy was like you <laughs> You know, blessed is your mother to have a son like you, because my son is in prison. Maybe he's a robber. Maybe they're going to crucify him. Maybe that's who the mother is. Maybe he's the robber, who as he's dying says, I deserve this. And he turns to Jesus and says, oh, remember me. So robber went to paradise. Could be, that could be his mother. So Mary is already the mother of the Messiah because she's interceding as the daughter of Zion for all Israel, for the coming of the Messiah. So she's already born the word in her soul before she bears the word in her body. She's already the mother of the Messiah. So Mary gives the Holy Spirit his fruitfulness. It's not necessary. God needs nobody or anybody to do anything he says. But he has placed himself as needing Mary by his own divine free will. And uh, because of his plan for the incarnation. So the word needs a mother, a human mother, to become human and take on our humanity. And uh, therefore, the Holy Spirit depends on Mary for the incarnation. Even though the Holy Spirit made everything out of nothing, and he can do that a thousand times if he wants, you know? So does the Holy Spirit then depend on you for the incarnation to keep happening? Yeah, yeah, that's why you're here. He depends on you to adopt Jesus. Otherwise, Jesus has no mother and has no mothers, right? So, if, you know, I don't want to force you into this, but <laughs> you can't handle it. So Mother Teresa used to say to the sisters on their first week in Calcutta in the novitiate, if you can't smile at the poor, pack your bags and go home. <laughs> the first time I said, that's Mother Teresa. I thought she was all 
lovey dovey, you know, she's she's so tough. And they all say that. The saints are so tough, you know. But but it's a mercy to people, you know. But anyway, um yeah, so Sister Sully Marie, we were laughing this morning. She said, Father, that around your neck, I just have to show you this. You put on the line. This is, I'm off on a tangent. No, it's There's so many father. I have so much stuff around my neck, yeah. No wonder the devil can't get me. He's terrified. People laugh at people with medals and everything around their neck, and they say, well, the reason they're smiling. So she noticed as I was changing after my sister, Celine Marie. It's not Celine, it's Celine, C-E-L-I-E. She said, oh, Father, you have the relic. So that's the blood of Mother Teresa of Calcutta. Yeah. No one has it. But I have it. Wow. My best friend from school is a surgeon in Ireland. He's one of the leading orthopedic surgeons in Ireland, but he did his training in New York. And one day he was called over to a hospital in a convent. He goes over and Mother Teresa's in the bed. And he had to do a little operation on her back. And he had two vials of blood. And he saved your blood. He sent oh. one vial to the lab where they do tests. And he's supposed to throw the other away because it's a biohazard. <laughs> and he just said, well, he took it home. <laughs> Three months later, she was back in Calcutta, she died. And he's a whole vial of her blood. <laughs> so I said, well, so I, I was chaplain here for four years. So every time I come to the sisters, I put it on. And I said, sister, that way every movement of my heart has to pass through mother's blood to reach you sisters. You know, so that I can love you as mother wants you to be loved and serve you as a priest, you know. And I said, every every affection of the sister has to go back through mother. She's right over my heart. Okay, that's a tangent. Mary depends on you to be fruitful. God depends on you to be fruitful. Therefore, we are all incorporated into the mystical body of the church, which is Christ. The living person of Christ. You're already incorporated into the mystical body of Christ. But if you make, if you sign these papers of adoption, if you sign your name that you want to adopt him as a priest, it's going to incorporate you deeper for all eternity. You will really be his mother in the eternal order of grace which is greater than my earthly mother, Elizabeth, being my natural mother. She was also a spiritual mother because she died offering her sufferings for my priesthood, my own mother. So my mother had both roles. <clears throat> and uh, this deeper incorporation into the body of Christ is happening at a time in history when God is releasing the grace of living in the divine will. Because Jesus says to Louisa, he said, I'm so sick. So many of my members are diseased. It's overcoming my whole body and destroying me. And he said, I need new healthy members because the more healthy members that are in my body, they can support the sick members and help cure the body. So he's calling us deeper into the body, which also means you're going to have to bear some of the suffering of Christ. So that's what I want to talk about a little bit. Simeon promised Our Lady that her heart should be pierced. You are very familiar with the fear of Our Lady in incarnation. We didn't say today at 12 o'clock, 6 o'clock, we celebrate the fiat of Our Lady in Incarnation, the Angelus, when Gabriel is sent from heaven. We're not so familiar with her fiat of redemption. In fact, as one sister said to me one time, she said, oh, Louisa, I, I, I read Louisa, but 
She said it was too much. She said at one stage, a lady, in, when Christ was hearing the crowd cry out, crucify him, crucify him. He's standing beside Pilate. Pilate says, what will I do with him? They all shout, crucify him. Jesus says to Louisa, my father was saying the same thing. And my mother was saying. And at that point, people say, whoa. <laughs> you know, because like in the movie Jesus of Nazareth, you know, she's <laughs> wailing at the cross. You know, but I feel in Mel Gibson's Passion of Christ, it's much more accurate. She's completely uh, standing within her deepest self before God and his will. It's not the crowd, it's not the soldiers, it's not everything that's happening, Jesus. She's standing before the Father in the complete annihilation of the will of God that he died, you know. They didn't say it the way the crowd said it, Mary and God the Father, but they willed it. Just You see what happened to Peter when he didn't will it. He said, oh, this can't happen, you. But Jesus said, that's Satan. That's the language of men, you know. So it's very deep that Our Lady also had a second fear to redemption. And God asked her for that fear. And she offered Jesus to be put to death to God. Would he have died on the cross if she had said no? No. No. She had to say yes for this to happen. So she did say yes. She knew ahead of time what was going to happen. And you will have to do the same if you're going to adopt priests. Because priests are called to die with Christ on the cross and crucified with them. And so be part of the redemption of the world. They don't just offer a sacrifice over here and off they go, you know. Jesus depended on Mary for his death. And that death was the one priestly sacrifice to the Father, and it was made with her consent. She didn't just consent to his incarnation. She consented to all the works of redemption. And that's why she suffered. If she had stayed in her inheritance in the divine will, which she was given from the start, she wouldn't have suffered. But because she said yes to the redemption, she suffered three types of suffering. First, your sins. Mary suffered because you sinned, because she's your mother. Do any of you mothers suffer when your children sin? Yeah, you do. Now, I was listening to our founder, Father Jim Flanagan, recently, and Father Jim is a very humble and um, discreet man. You know, he's just an amazing saint. He, he's dead now, but... He's talking to the novices, and he said, you know, he said, I used to come home from, a school, from school as a child, and he said, I would sit with my mother, and we would just talk. He said, one day, out of the blue, she said to me, Jimmy, she said, I would rather they brought you home from school in a coffin than that you would commit a sin against God. <laughs> He's normally not that dramatic, Father Fine. You know? But he said, my mother just said it out of the blue, you know, and she meant it. And he said, that was a major point in my life as a child, you know. He didn't take it as an offense, you know. But so Mary's first pain is your sins. Her second pain is your pain. If you're in pain, Our Lady feels your pain. So there's the pain of your sins, and there's also the pain because you love other people who sin. They're, those sins aren't your fault, but you take on the pain of others. So she has all those pains too. And Jesus says to Louisa, even that is nothing compared to the fact that she took all my pains as the innocent one. So she took all his pains too. Let me see, I have it in the music here. Jesus told me, speaking to Louisa, my little daughter, 
you must know that in order to form the kingdom of redemption, those who distinguished themselves most in suffering were me and my mama. And even though apparently she suffered none of the pains that other creatures knew, except for my death on the cross, which everybody knew about. We all know she was standing there at the cross on Good Friday. And which was the fatal and harrowing blow to her maternal heart. More than any most sor sorrowful death could give. Because she possessed the unity of the light of the divine will, this light brought to her pierced heart not only the seven swords told by the church, but all swords, spears, and arrows, all piercings of all sins and the pains of all creatures, which martyred her maternal heart, and this was nothing. The light of my will also brought her my pains, my humiliations, my torments, my thorns, my nails, and the most intimate pains of my heart. The heart of my mama is really the true son of creation, S-U-L. This light contains all goods and effects that the earth could receive. The light of Mary's heart is all the goods and effects that the earth could ever wish for. The same for the sovereign queen. One can only see her on the outside as a person. By the light of my supreme will, she enclosed within herself all possible pains. And the less they're known, the more power they had over the divine heart of God. To beg for the longed for redeemer. And her light then descends into the hearts of creatures to conquer them and bind them in the kingdom of redemption. If the church knew what my mother suffered, they would not speak of the seven swords. You've seen her immaculate, <clears throat> the seven swords in it but of millions of swords. Now, what Jesus has to do before the end of time is he formed the kingdom of redemption together with his mother in secret pains. But he had to reveal at least his pains. He kept his mother hidden inside his humanity. So we hardly know about her pains. Like we're used to the seven swords, but most of the other pains we can only kind of guess at. <clears throat> but those pains have fruit, and it's that fruit we receive every time our sins are forgiven, every time we become holier, every time disgrace is given, heaven bless that. It's all the fruit of Christ's suffering. And he says to Louisa, if no one knew what I suffered, they'd never love me, and <laughs> they'd never come for the fruits. As it is, he said, They've trampled them, most of them, for 2,000 years. Isn't it amazing that after 2,000 years, we're still doing such a job? What are we doing? It's 2,000 years after all the works of redemption were done. Uh, we're killing our children. Do not just say, when are we ever going to come holy as God wishes us to be holy? But he said, I have to make my pains known. He said, but... I intend that the world know what my mother suffered. We don't know yet, but he intends it. And so I, I just tell you that because that's what's behind all the talk about a chastisement coming. You wouldn't want to see the chastisement as that oh, God is just sick of us. <laughs> and he is sick. We've made him sick. But it's not just that he's run out of patience and he wants to get us. You know, it's much higher than that, and it's much purer than that. Jesus wants the world to know eventually 
what his mother suffered and that he suffered. And when that happens, there will be a tremendous light released from the heart of Mary. The piercing of her heart will come to full fruition in the earth, like the sun rising this morning, bursting over the surface of earth. And it's so powerful, it will penetrate men's minds and hearts so that their conscience are illuminated. That's what's coming in the chastisement. It's a gift of knowing the fullness of Mary's sufferings. You wouldn't want to see it as just, well, he's just going to wipe out half the world because, you know, there's so much coming. Do you see that? See, Simeon said that. He said, a oh, sword. Uh, your son will be a sign of contradiction and the sword will pierce your heart so that the secret thoughts of many may be laid bare. And so that's coming and it will be a fulfillment of Jesus' desire that we love and thank his mother that she suffered every one of our sins, every one of our pains and all Jesus' pains too. He, he does want to reveal his mother to the world and we're... we're we're still at the seven swords. Okay. Then he says to Louisa, just as it was for redemption between my, me and my mother, which was formed first between me and my celestial mother, and then became known to creatures, so it will be with the supreme fear. And then he says, I've chosen you, Louisa, to suffer with me. I kept you in bed for 30 years. You went through the passion with me constantly. You suffered all those deprivations, which no one understands is the worst pain a human being can have. Having seen Jesus, for him, they would draw himself there. And the longing in Louisa's heart, she said, it's more than any pain, you know, that you could have in, in, in the world. Therefore, it's necessary that I make known to the world how much the kingdom of the divine will cost me and our lady and Louisa so that man may enter into what he has lost so I was reading that last week only and I work um, at the halting site in Waterford with the travelers you know and I went over that afternoon and I look at them all you know it's total chaos and I said lost children we're all lost children we've lost our kingdom you know I say why are we like this you know well it's because we're no longer in paradise and we haven't reached the new kingdom yet we're, we're stuck in between you know we're kind of healed but we're not fully healed and you know we're still struggling with all the realities of evil redemption and I just looked at all the tragedies and said just little children who are lost, you know, and I just got to be the sunshine for the day. All these pains laid the foundations of the kingdom of my will, but they're maturing the fruits of the divine will. Okay. <clears throat> so you want to be prepared if you're going to adopt a priest for uh, a few trials and a few crosses. Because you can't just do it in pieces. You can't give the gift of yourself in pieces. You either give yourself totally to this work, and then God will give you everything you need, as he gave Mary. All the graces Mary had to stand her ground. But um, sometimes when you take on a new work of, of God, uh, sometimes you get a little shock, you know. Because certain trials and storms start coming your way. And you want to uh, uh, live them united with the wounds of Jesus and Mary, and you'll be fine, you know. You want to see where they're coming from. And uh, you want to have a strong core. You know in uh, Pilates? Yeah. Do you want to do Pilates? Yeah, they have the core exercises. Do you know that? No. Uh, yeah. yeah, so instead of just exercising your legs or your arms that. You've got the core of your body. Everything hangs in that. My arms and legs, everything hangs in that. My head balances on top of the whole lot. But they like you to do your core exercise because if your core is strong, the rest you'll be able to carry even if a limb is slightly injured or that. 
And you need the ability to stand your ground with Mary. So I'm just going to mention, we have five minutes left, uh, the seven spiritual commitments that Parato, uh, the association of uh, Luisa Pecoretta, and uh, the beginnings of this work of adopting priests um, have asked. Here are your seven, seven spiritual commitments. Simply first, that you adopt uh, a priest in the kingdom of the divine will. Do you know who that is? No, you don't need to know. It's like de Montfort says, once you're consecrated to Our Lady, you just give her all your graces and you let her distribute them <coughs> because she knows how to distribute them. You could pick an individual, I presume. We've got to get this figured out. We're figuring it out as we go along with what Corrado are advising. But um, first, just to freely say, yeah, you match me with the right Thing. Because in your natural order, he gave you the children that God decided for eternity. You, know, you can't send them back and say, oh, I've already with a child. They're trying to do that with genetic engineering. This is not the child I wanted. Number two, you live the gospel in the light of the divine will. Three, be willing to know and deepen the truths of the divine will that Please, God, your priestly son will be spreading throughout the world. So just like a mother exchanges nutrients and uh, uh, all sorts of proteins into the um, um, immune system of a child through the placenta, you know, the incredible thing, the placenta, they're still discovering wondrous things, <laughs> what goes back and forth between them a mother's body and her child's body through the placenta. Uh, if you are really going to be uh, incorporated in the body of Christ and united with the priest, and so there'll be a flow back and forth between your heart, your spiritual life, your spiritual healthiness, and the healthiness of the priest. And also some of his unhealthiness depends who our lady matches you with. she will know who to to put the unhealthy priests with. The help you give, the priest you adopt, will be consistent with the healthiness of your spiritual life. The fiat should be the motto of your soul. All your actions, prayers, sufferings of spirit and body, offerings, joys, etc., collect them as a bundle of glory as a gift to offer to the Father for the benefit of your apostle of the divine will. <clears throat> we have a new priest in Waterford. This is public, so I can tell you this much. He is just a wonderful soul. He's in his 40s, and he was a chemist before. And of course, thanks be to God, he managed not to get married. <laughs> So he eventually decided he was to be a priest, at which point his mother told him she had consecrated him as a baby. You know? And uh, he made a little film for Shalom World on his vocation, you know. And he's very gifted, brilliant mind. And he's the type of priest, you really want to give him one job and he'll just do it all day, you know. He'll forget to eat, he'll forget to do everything else. But... He went through Maynooth and they've put him into parish life. So he was ordained six months ago. He's out. He's my neighbor. He's just wonderful. He was doing a funeral recently and his mind slipped completely. Stress, overwhelmed. You know, I could see it coming six months ago. Well, what am I going to do? Go to the bishop? <laughs> and uh, because he's like me, I can't do that. And we live in a world of, now we're doing this. Now we're doing this. You know, like I was telling him, I, you know, this was announced at the masses that he's taking time off, you know, because he was overwhelmed within six months, you know. But then, uh, you know, I said, Mark, switch off the phone at five. Just gift it to Jesus and switch it off. I said, you won't be able, you know. If they're dying, 
tell them they have to bang on your front door that you don't answer the phone after five, you know. And um, but it wasn't clicking with them. And uh, next time he came over to my house, he was, came over for something. Two phones. He's talking to me. He's two phones. I said, "Mark, why you got two phones? Well, this is for this." And I thought he's going to crash, you know. He, he's be brilliant in. Uh, in um, as a chaplain, for example, in a hospital or a prison, but parish life, you know, whereas our parish priest, Father Richard, very young priest, he can juggle seven or eight balls in, at the one time. It's just amazing. I look at him and think, how, how do you do that? You know, he was over the other day talking to me and I, I said, Richard, it's dinner time. And he said, I won't eat till nine o'clock tonight. He's fine. But I knew the other priest couldn't do this because I can't do it. So... Um, but um, so uh, when you adopt a priest you have to take on a certain amount of the troubles in the priesthood six invoke a crown of ejaculating prayers in the form of respective litanies this is what Corrado asked me to do for the unity of those priests scattered throughout the world so that in communion of mind soul and will in apostolic work, they carry out their mission with divine concordance, united to the things of heaven, and with the unity that reigns in the Holy Trinity. Wow. Wouldn't the world be completely changed if every priest began the day in concordance with the things of heaven and the Holy Trinity? Seven. Pray for priests. <laughs> You're good at that. And here's your apostolic commitment. Commit to spreading the spirit of the mission to which you belong, first by testimony of life, and when God allows it, also by the word. Forming groups when possible to expand this mission in cooperation with the prior written approval of the official association of Luisa Pecoretta. Contact details below or near. Okay. So if you need to leave now, but I just want to say, I have to say this, a few things about the priesthood today, because this is when you're alive. You'll be alive for a few more years, please God. What's happening to priests today so that you're aware of what, what's going on? You see, priesthood, like everything else in the church, goes through cycles. You know, one minute it's glorious and wonderful in some countries. Other times it's a time of persecution, you know. You get up in the morning in Mexico, 1930, uh, 30, and the government is shooting priests and sisters. Suddenly, this, you know, you, you just don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I'm just skipping a few things here. The time in which Jesus lived, he addressed the people as an adulterous generation, <clears throat> unfaithful to God, unfaithful to each other, every promise broken. And uh, this time we live in is a repeat of the adulterous generation. What does the adulterous generation understand? Only the Paschal mystery. They have to crucify you and you have to forgive them. And then they'll be okay. Then they look at you and say, who are you? Where, where did you get this love? But the, there's a problem, as you see in the Western world and Ireland and that, uh, a terrible sickness of impurity. And uh, it's seeping right into the priesthood. And uh, the families from which the priests and the sisters are supposed to come and consecrate at life, uh, the mothers and fathers are unfaithful to each other, either in their imagination or with someone else, you know, in sterilization, contraception, all those realities. And so, the fountain of grace that flows through a mother and father to their children is just drying up. And so the children are lost. 
and uh, then it's all exaggerated now in, in uh, multiplied in a worse form by uh, the cell phones. So I can see in the children uh, until they get their first phone, they might last about seven or eight. You could see the beauty of the light of original innocence in them. Even on the halting site where there's chaos and people with major addiction problems and just a lot of bad stuff going on, the children are amazing. <laughs> they play and they laugh and, you know, and I'm like Santa Claus, you know, I come up, they start grabbing me. It's so beautiful. You know, father, father, you know, some of them don't have fathers. You know, I just love something. You know, it's a little girl of six. Teresa Marie, you know, she says, Father. <laughs> She's no father, you know. It's so beautiful, you know. But suddenly about seven or eight, they get serious because they start seeing things on their phones that are, you know, then that enters their imagination. You try getting it out. They're going to have that their whole life. There is a way to heal them, but that's for another day, you know. So the priests are going to have to live a witness of redemptive suffering. That's what Christ did for his adulterous generation. He let them crucify him. And he gave them his divine mercy from his pierced heart and his holy wounds to heal an adulterous generation. And you're going to see a repeat of that at the moment. So the priests are being called to that. And so uh, when a priest enters the poverty of Christ and the chastity of Christ and the obedience of Christ, there are three nails crucify them. But it's a beautiful crucifixion because they gift back to God all earthly treasures in their vow of obedience. They gift back their self-will, which is the big sin of our times. I, I, I'm my own God, you know. They gift back their self-will into the divine will in obedience. And then they gift back their power to give life in chastity, to give life. See, it gives, they give life by dying with Christ on the cross and then rising with him in the divine will. So I ask God that every day. Every day I say to God, may I die in my human will and rise in your divine will. And Lord, I don't want to wait one hour for that to happen. <laughs> I've got on the earth. I say, I don't want to waste a minute. Let's do it now, you know. And you say to people, you say to seminarians or priests, or, you say, ask Jesus to crucify you. What? Mm -hmm. Oh, no. Oh, yeah, that's a bit much. We don't use that language. Mm -hmm. I said, well, 2,000 years ago, Jesus told you to pick up your cross. I said, now you're proposing a better way above that. There's no other way. Because he would have told you 2,000 years ago, and he didn't. He said, pick up your cross. And so every time in the gospel, it's like Mark says, for example, at a time when his popularity was overflowing, crowds were coming after him, everybody loved him, he wanted to be healed. And he took the apostles aside and said to them, I'm going up to Jerusalem to be crucified. So you have to keep the reality of his triumph and his crucifixion, both in your soul at the same time. Because if it's just the crucifixion, you won't be able for it. If it's the triumph of the cross, then you'll be fine, you know? It's just the triumph and no crucifixion. It's not going to happen, you know? So he's, he's doing that. And so now what you have in the seminaries, the formation of priests and that, is a big pile of self-pity. And no one wants to call it. Oh, poor little me, you know? Well, I'm just a poor sinner. Yeah, I know. Yeah, you are a poor sinner, but that's not the end of the story, you know? And uh, so you have people using the expression all the time. Uh, I went to confession a while back, just down the road here, James's Hospital. I was in James's Hospital, I saw the chaplain. I said, Father, and I was in for something, so I actually hadn't got my collar on. I was in to see a doctor, you know, so I had to, uh, well, I wasn't dressed like a priest. I said, 
are you free? He said, yeah. I said, can I go to confession? He said, yeah, sure. He said, I'm a priest. Oh, he said, are you in the hospital? Yeah, I said, I'm a patient, you know. So, so we went to confession. He was a lovely priest from another country, you know. Now, I had, I presume, I'm allowed to tell you about my own confession, but nobody else's. <laughs> I had what the word would consider, a, you know, that's not too serious, you know. But in the confession, you know, I said, I'm sorry. I let God down. I should have done this or said this, you know. And he said to me, you're only human, you know. And penitence say it to me. I say to them, well, this is what God has. What? I'm only human, you know. Yeah. No, your humanity has been united to the divinity of Christ. In the imprint on your soul of your baptism and confirmation, and if you're a priest in holy orders, Everything that happens to you is repeated in heaven through that imprint. So I'm a priest every second of my life, not just when I'm saying mass or giving out sacraments, when I'm asleep or eating a pink cupcake. <laughs> All that's going through Christ, the only eternal high priest in heaven to the Father. Every single thing I think do say, it's all passing through the divine imprint on my soul. It's by that divine imprint I have the power and authority to act in the person of Christ and change bread and wine into his body and blood and forgive sins. That's not me doing it. It's the divine imprint working in my soul. I have to have the right stuff. I have to use oil when I anoint. I have to use bread and wine. There's rules about this. I have to use the right words. I can't make up my own words of consecration, my own words of absolution. But I need a third thing. I need a divine imprint that the Holy Spirit is stamped on my soul so that it's Christ acting in me. And, well, you're only human. We've overplayed. I, I, yes, you know, Pope Francis is leading us in compassion and mercy and our human weaknesses. But we need to elevate what it means to be human. Christ did not become an angel. He became human and united our humanity to his divinity. And if you're not on board with that, forget going into the divine will, because that's going to elevate you to the very purpose for which you were created, which is to share in the life of the Trinity while you're still on earth. We're used to saying, well, yeah, that eventually happens. If we get to purgatory, get to heaven, you know? So, and I find that priests who are living in self-pity they fall into sin much more quickly, you know? Well, I, you know, I, I've i got to have my holiday, you know? And we all feel sorry. I know, Father, you're overworked. And he's like, my golf. And, you know, exercise is very important. I was swimming yesterday. You know, I run, I swim, I lift a few weights, you know? My hobby at night, I don't own a television, you know? I repair statues, you know, and then I'll work it with my hands and stuff like that. But, and gosh, if I was to feel self pity, you know, I think I'd be, gone. I'd be in trouble very quick, you know. I say, you have pity on me. I don't need to pity myself. You know, I'm, my, my mother has pity on me. And so I entrust myself to her. <clears throat> And so I, I was in a supermarket a while back, and uh, two of the people in the supermarket, as I was passing them, were talking about two priests that I knew. You know? And I didn't have my collar wrong. So I, I passed him by, they're talking about the priest. They're saying, oh, they're just wonderful, and oh, he's so good, and things like that, you know? And I thought, that's nice, you know? And I went off, <laughs> I could hear Jesus. 2,000 years ago, woe to you when people speak well of you. For so they spoke of the false prophets. Oh, yeah, that's right, she said. It. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't. We should speak well of our priests, support them, help them, and things like that. But we have to keep a balance, you know, because I'm going to appear before God and answer the divine imprint on my soul, you know. And uh, there's nothing the demons like better than a priest who's a false prophet. 
they're cheering him on. And when he dies, they're going to put him on their shoulders and march him into hell and say, we got him. You know? It's very sober, but we have to remember it. You be very careful. You're better to be persecuted for the truth, you know, in this world. And we live in a time of persecution, but you're better to be persecuted. Uh, for the truth than to have people praise you, you know. As it is, as I said to you the last day, priesthood is a bit of a joke, Father Ted. That's what I said. In, I was in a local parish last Sunday because Father has had his breakdown. They had to rope me in. <laughs> Sometimes people complain about my holidays, so they had to rope me in because the other priest is on holidays. This is only the parish priest who gave me the country church. And I said to the people, you know, the priest is either disliked or hated or given out to if he doesn't say the exact thing you want at funerals and everything. I said, or he's just a big joke. He's Father Ted, you know? I said, my gosh, Christ was a priest. You know, you want to be very careful with your Father Ted stuff, you know? And they have the Father Ted celebrations on the Aran Islands every year. And all the people go out, all the people, and everybody wears a collar for Father Ted Week, you know? And they interviewed the priest a couple of years ago, you know? He said, oh, it's wonderful. Oh, it's great. Oh, yeah, great laugh. And then there was another priest. I don't know who he is. I think he was in the Carlo area. I'm saying this because it's public knowledge, but I heard him being interviewed on RTE because he was a young, newly ordained priest, and people loved him. He was just... Uh, very gifted. Uh, many priests are very gifted. If they knew where their gifts were coming from, but God can take their natural gifts and then embellish them with grace, you know, and use them. So he's great. And they said to him on RT radio, and uh, what about the priests getting married? Well, he said, I mean, he's just New York. Yeah, I think the priests will get married. He says, where it gets me is, he says, when I go to the wedding receptions, he said, after a while, everybody is dancing and everything. I'm just sitting there alone. And then I come home and I have no significant other in my life. Uh -huh. And I thought, you are gone. God bless you. I, I wish I could help you. But he's not going to last too long. Self-pity, you know. And, and the travelers say to you, they can't get over. All the time they say to you, and you're not married. And you have no kids. No, I said. And I said, but Jesus wasn't married, you know? And I said, I'm your father. You're all my kids. Oh, yeah, that's right. And I said, you know, I said, because we, I can say anything to them. I said, you know the way you're always shouting at each other? And they start laughing. They can't talk to each other. They just shout all the time, you know? And kids do anything. So I stop that, you know? And I just say, no, no, watch, watch. Just say it quietly. You can do that, you know? I say, but I said, I love to go home to my empty house. And then they look at me and they know what I'm talking about. I said, I know Jesus in the tabernacle. I said, you know. The other day I was walking around my house talking to Jesus and singing, you know. And I stopped and I started laughing. I said, Jesus, it's a good thing I live alone. <laughs> Anyone who heard me. Okay. Okay, let's finish. I, I want to finish with a quote by... Um, Sure. Very good. Go to the side door for sister. Okay, yeah. Okay. God bless you. Very interesting. So, so just in in the light of the priesthood and the times we live in, and um, when Paul the sixth gathered the last general council for the Second Vatican Council, he said to them, "This is what happened at the council." He said. The Church of the Second Vatican Council, we're living in the fruits of that work of the Holy Spirit in the Church. He said the, the Church at the Council was not just concerned with herself and her relationship with God, but with man. That's the mission of the Church in the world, man. Man, this Pope... St. Paul the Sixth, right? <laughs> Peace saintly popes in the last few years. Man as he really is today, living man, man all wrapped up in himself. Man who makes himself not only the center 
of every interest, but dares to claim that he is the principle and explanation of reality. All that seeping into the priesthood in the seminary, we're not immune from, from that spirit of our times. Man, ever frail, unreal, selfish and savage. Look at the headlines. Savage headlines. Man unhappy with himself as he laughs and cries. Man, the narrow devotee of nothing but scientific reality. Man as he is, a creature who thinks and loves and toils and is always waiting for something. Isn't that a beautiful line from both? He recognizes we're all waiting for something. You know, this man is hungry. Secular hu humanism revealing itself in its horrible anti-clerical reality has in a certain sense defied the council. So the council, the church made certain propositions to the world and the world said, we're not interested in the church. And the Pope recognized that. The religion of the God who became man has met the religion of man who makes himself God. And what happened? Was there a clash, a battle, a condemnation? There could have been, but there was none. See, the church could have pushed back against the world and condemned the world after the battle council. They were trying to come, give you the message of the gospel, and you don't want it. And it was one of those councils where there wasn't a list of condemnations afterwards. That's why they call it a pastoral council. The old story of the Samaritan has been the model of the spirituality of the council. So that's the model for priests at the moment, and all of us. A feeling of boundless sympathy. And women are better at that than men. Women are better with boundless sympathy. That's why Jesus wants you to be the mothers of priests. They can have a contribution from their fathers, their formators, but he needs them to have mothers. The attention of our council has been absorbed by human needs. And we call upon those who turn themselves modern humanists and who've renounced transcendent realities to give the council credit for at least one thing, we honor man. <clears throat> so, that's it. You adopt Christ as priest and as victim. He's priest and he's victim. And you share in his priesthood and his victim. See, he's a ransom. You can be a ransom too. Christ, as we know from the New Testament, is priest and victim. Prior to this, the priests of the Old Covenant sacrificed animals, lambs, bulls, goats, turtle doves. But in the priesthood of Jesus, the priesthood of the New Covenant, the priest offers himself as victim. That's what we need for an adulterous generation. If I fight back, argue back, struggle back with people, they're used to that. Because everyone's doing that. It's a reaction. It's not Our Lady's way. Don't react. Our Lady takes it and turns it over in our heart and then responds as God tells her to. But we're all reacting. We're talking too quickly, too much. You know? In the letter to the Hebrews, it calls Christ the high priest and the eternal priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. This is the once and for all sacrifice in which he himself was the victim and a priestly intercession which continues forever in heaven. I told them, I'm finished. I told the people in Car Valley last Sunday, I said, you see how restless everybody is? Because they were restless because I was talking a lot. I didn't say that, but they're all restless in their seats. And they're saying, well, who's this priest to get the long homily, you know? I said, everyone is restless, I said. It's a huge disappointment to tell people that when John describes heaven in the book of Revelations, it's an eternal mass. It's an eternal mass. It's the wedding feast of the Lamb. 
And Christ is offering himself in the inner sanctuary for all eternity. We're all celebrating Mass for all eternity. You better get used to it. <laughs> <laughs>